Thanks everyone. Uh, so here we are on the road to zero friction testing. I know testing can be quite difficult for some people. Um, it, it might seem like a waste of time or it's, it's too hard or it's a, a lot of effort. And so we're here to uh, reduce that friction. Um, we're going to be talking about Drupal test traits and how you can get the most out of using them. Uh, my name is Michael Strellen. I'm from Previous Next. Uh, if you were in um, Drupal South in Brisbane last year, I gave a talk, Five Simple Tips to Level Up Your Legacy Code. Uh, if you weren't there or you haven't seen it, you can check it out on YouTube. Um, but the number one tip that I gave was uh, to use automated testing. Um, so today we're going to uh, talk about how to get started using Drupal test traits. Uh, we'll walk through writing your first test. Then we'll uh, dive into how to build a library of uh, project-specific traits to make your life easier uh, and go over how we can maximize performance and reliability of your test suite and talk about fostering a test culture within your development team. Uh, I believe immediately after this, there's another talk about testing in this room. I Think, I'm not too sure, but I think it's going to go over some of the more fundamentals about like um, how to write tests in general, uh, whereas mine kind of assumes a bit more you know a little bit about testing, but we're trying to um, you know, make the most of this Drupal test traits library. So Drupal test traits is a um, composer package uh, that basically lets you run tests against an existing Drupal site with user content, real content types, real views, modules installed and everything, uh, compared to like a traditional PHP unit test where you're basically mocking up a um, environment just to test like an individual piece of functionality. So some prerequisites. Um, you need a local development environment. I know everybody has one of these. Some of us are fortunate enough to have a production environment, uh, sorry, a separate production environment. That's a joke. Um, <laughs> you need Composer and you need a Drupal site. Uh, so if you just want to follow along, like if you're looking at this later uh, and you don't have a Drupal site you want to use, you can follow these commands to get you um, basically a recommended project thing. This is Using ddev, you can use whatever else you'd like to use instead. And we're just running the um, Drush site install with the standard profile. Uh, so obviously, you need uh, the Drupal test traits package. Um, and you need core dev. Or I guess you don't technically need core dev, but you need these packages that come with core dev. Uh, I'm not going to go into what they all do. Um, so then uh, you need to configure your PHP unit.xml file. The main thing here, uh, which you, there's an example that you can get from the Drupal test traits docs directory, just copy it to the root of your project. And the main thing you need to do is set the Drupal test traits or DTT, I'm going to refer to from now on, um, the base URL. And so that's where your PHP unit executable can contact the Drupal site. So if you're using a, um, if it's all local, you might just use localhost. If it's in a container, you know, it might be some other Docker IP or whatever, or with ddev, you can use the fully qualified domain name. Um, and that basically looks something like that. And then uh, to test that it's working, you can, there's an example test um, which you can run against your standard profile installation that we did in a previous step, uh, which exists in the Drupal test traits uh, library. Basically, just run the PHP unit command and pass it the path to the test. Um, the dot there indicates that the test ran successfully, and we ran one out of one test, and they 100% pass rate, and it all ran in two and a half seconds. So without looking at the code for the test, it's done a whole bunch of things. So it's created an admin user, a taxonomy term, an article node, tagged the node with the term, published the node, and then performed some assertions. So we tested that the author of the node is the admin user. 
we tested that we can browse to the article in an actual browser, or it's not really a real browser, but um, and we test that we can log in as the author and have access to edit that page. And so that all completes in two and a half seconds. So you can start to see the power of this compared to having you know manual user testing that's going to take I don't know at least five minutes. Um, so if you want to see what's actually happening in that test, you can enable HTML output. Basically, we just need to add the printer class attribute in our PHP unit XML file. There's plenty of documentation on how to do all this. Um, and we basically need to set a directory where it's going to write the HTML files. And so having a look what that looks like when you run the test again, uh, basically you get a bunch of links at the bottom to they represent every uh, HTTP request that was made during the test. And if we click on them, we can see there's our article, um, there's the login page. We're now logged in as the admin user. Um, we're editing the article, and after we've saved it, we can see it again. So that's really helpful if you want to debug, like, what's going on? Why is this failing? Um, maybe you'll see here it actually says access denied or something like that, and so that's why your test is failing. So moving on uh, to write our first test. Um, that example test was against the standard installation profile, um, but we want to do a, um, some cool things with layout builder and content moderation. So we're going to install Umami, run this Drush site install demo Umami. There we have the familiar food blog magazine thing. Um, all right, so basically, in this test, oh, so some um, conventions for writing your test that you need to follow. Basically, the class name and the file name needs to end in test with a capital T. Uh, each test method in your class needs to start with the lowercase word test, and you need to set the namespace accordingly. So if you're in a, con a custom module or contrib module, I guess custom module for this, um, use that namespace, Drupal slash test slash module name slash functional. And then if it's project specific, you can drop the Drupal part of it and the module name and place it like in a root directory somewhere, but you have to configure uh, PSR for class mappings in your composer file. Um, it's really up to you. If, I guess like if you're writing tests that don't really relate to any particular module, that's a, a good way to do it. Just put all your tests in the root somewhere. So your first test will end up looking something like that, like this. So in this test, we're going to create an admin role and a user. Then we're going to log in and visit and create. We're going to cr visit the um, basic page creation form via the UI. Um, and we're going to create a page, assert that um, a message appears saying, you know, the basic page has been created. You know, confirm that it worked. We're going to test that the title that we assigned appears in the H1 tag of the page. And then we're going to uh, assert that the body text appears somewhere in the page. So when we run that, um, it looks like that. We've got our HTML output. It's in our Umami theme. You can see the title and the body text and uh, the little green message saying that it completed successfully. So we're Winning. All right, let's move on. So just a, a quick note. So in that test, we used the UI, like the um, node form, to create the node. Um, it's often faster to just use the API to create the node directly. So the Drupal test traits package uh, has a bunch of helper functions, like create node. Um, so basically, we use that create a node set the title and the body and the um, publish it and save it. And that happens a lot quicker than having to like actually log into the site and load up the node form and save it and all of that. So depending on what you're testing, like if you're testing the form itself, then you want to do it via the UI. If you're testing like the functionality of the node, then just create it via the API. 
So uh, another note on cleaning up after yourself. So because you're testing against a real database um, with content, you don't really want all this this test data in there. So Drupal test traits actually um, it, it deletes all the entities that you create when the test completes, whether it passes or fails, doesn't matter. So if you're using um, the create node method that I mentioned before, um, this contains this this dot mark entity for cleanup, and then at the end of the test in the teardown Drupal method, anything that's been marked for cleanup will be deleted. Um, with the UI tests, because we were creating a user via the UI and logged in as that, when that user is deleted, then their associated content is also deleted. Uh, but you may find sometimes you need to implement your own teardown function um, if you're doing something else like changing config around or whatever. Um, you might want to reset it to the original state. Okay, so the next part of the talk is about building a library of project-specific traits. So um, basically what you can do is identify common patterns in your existing tests, um, abstract these into methods that you put into traits. Um, where possible, uh, use base classes. So we usually recommend like when you start a project, um, you create a base class that all your tests are going to extend from, and that's going to extend from Drupal test traits existing site base. Uh, and that you can put any common methods that you're always going to be using in there. And by doing this, you basically reduce the amount of test code that you have to write every time, and you reduce the need to think, which reduces the friction. Uh, so moving on to a, a layout builder example. So um, if you, let's say we create a custom block type that we want to embed in Layout Builder and we want to test how it appears on the page. To do this um, programmatically in your test, normally you'd have to create an instance of that block, then you have to populate all the block fields, then create a Layout Builder component and attach the block, create a Layout Builder section and attach the component, create a node and attach the section, publish the node, and visit the node. That's a lot. So that looks like this. This is 36 lines of code, and I, I already hear it. Like, I don't want to do that. I'm not writing all that code. That's too much. Does anyone here get paid by the number of lines of code that they write? <laughs> um, so let's look at how we can uh, break this up into some traits that we're going to reuse again for the next block type that we create or, yeah, other areas that we might use it. So um, first of all, I think we can have a, a block content test trait. So in this, we can um, create the block content entity uh, and put that um, entity cleanup stuff so that the block content's going to be deleted when the test completes, because that doesn't happen automatically with Drupal test traits. It does for nodes, users, taxonomy terms, but there isn't something for block content. Um, and then maybe we'll put some helper functions in there for each of the, our block content types, like basic block, or if we have some other more sophisticated blocks, uh, we can create helper functions that have like named parameters, for example, so you can pass in um, you know, the title and the body and whatever other fields. Um, then we're going to have a, a recipe creation uh, trait, because this is umami, so it's all about recipes. So we're going to use that, that node creation trait that comes with DTT, um, but we're going to populate some default values. So instead of having to give it a title and a body every time, we're just going to have those as default. Um, and yeah, if you want to take it a bit further, you could have bundle classes for your recipes where you can implement like getters and setters, like set title, set body, set steps to cook or whatever. Um, then we might have a, a layout builder manipulation trait, because if we remember there was all of those steps we need to take to create the block and embed it in all of those different places. And then finally a content moderation trait, maybe we'll have like a save and publish function 
Um, so we can do all that in one hit without having to write multiple lines because most of the time we're not, you know, testing that we need to save it as a draft and needs review and all of that, except in our moder in our workflow tests. But this is our block, our layout builder block test, so we don't actually care about the specifics of that. So that 36 lines has now been reduced down to 11 lines of code, but I still have to think about this. You're still uh, going through all the steps of creating the block and the component and the section and um, placing it on the page and everything. So I think we can abstract it a bit more. So uh, if you create a few more methods, it can look like this. So basically we create um, our body text, we create our block, and we create our recipe, and then we have this uh, function that does a bit of everything, so add inline block to node. So that's combined those three or four steps we had before. Um, and then a publish and visit, so that's doing our uh, save, set the moderation state, and the, the Drupal get um, to load the page. And then we just do our assertions after that to check that the body text appears on the page. That's down to seven lines of code. So some other possible traits that'll help you to speed things up when you're writing the test. Uh, helpers for every content type or entity bundle that you have. Um, just makes it a lot easier than remembering like all the machine names of the fields that you need to set. Um, if you just have, you know, your IDE can auto-complete um, all the fields and everything like that. Then maybe some like page element assertion helpers, like if you want to test that the breadcrumbs, uh, like the expect, you know, I want home about whatever, maybe if you have a helper function for that and that will check that it's got the right class names and all of that on the on your markup. Um, or you could do the same for local tasks or meta tags, you know, assert that the meta description is whatever. And then probably some utilities like assert order in page. So if you have a re requirement to list things A to Z or by weight or whatever, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you could have a, a function like that that scans that each of those uh, expected items appear in the right order. Things like creating random URLs or random emails, which are, are good for just like dummy data for testing. Um, some entity loading helpers. So um, when you're creating things via the UI in your test, you don't have an easy way to access the um, object that was just created. Uh, whereas if you do it via the API, um, you've got it immediately. But you could do, use um, like a last created entity function or a load by properties function. Um, that will do just do a quick query to find your entity that you created. Then maybe some like editorial section helpers if you're using Workbench Access, search API indexing if you're using that. Uh, and basically, yeah, the list goes on for whatever requirements your project has. So when, once you've got a fairly healthy set of tests um, in, a, in your test suite, you might find that you're running them um, on every pull request in um, CI, in Circle, or GitHub Actions, or whatever, and it, it, you might feel that it's slowing you down. You know, it takes half an hour for your 200, 500, 1,000 tests to complete, um, and it, it can get quite frustrating, especially if you know they start to fail, and you, you have to wait 25 minutes to find out that it was failing, and then you've got to go back and do it again. Um, so we're going to talk about how you can maximize test suite performance and reliability. Because um, the other part of it is if you have uh, what's called flaky tests that pass sometimes and fail other times, they can be really frustrating. So the first uh, thing is to avoid unnecessary work. So like I mentioned before, create entities via the API where you can, unless you're specifically testing the UI or the form to create the entity, then just do it via the API. Um, you know, don't attach images where you don't need to. Like if you have an image field, you might want to test it once in one 
test, but you don't have to upload an image to every single uh, entity you create. And then, yeah, limit the scope of the test. So, um, you know, don't, basically don't populate all the fields of your entity if you don't need to. So, um, I have an example. Um, this is kind of extrapolated from something that I found when I was doing some refactoring on a project recently. Basically, we had a, um, there's a requirement that external links on a page get like a specific HTML class and then they've got, you know, like the little icon that says it's external. Um, and this was kind of um, being tested within, I think it might have been Layout Builder or something like this. So we're doing a whole lot of work to create a block and attach it to a page and all of that stuff. But then if you're familiar with data providers, basically you can provide, um, basically run the same test many times against different um, pieces of data. So we've got our list of URLs that we're going to run the test on. And it was running, like creating a block and a page and all of that for every single URL. And there was something like 20 of them. So that's a, a waste of time because really we only need to test that the, um, uh, the class gets applied if it's considered external and it doesn't get applied if it's considered internal. So we can um, do that once and then run a, a much faster unit test to, to do the pattern matching. Like, so to see example.com is not external and um, example.org.drupal.org is external, Drupal.org is external, all of that. So, um, Basically, this is what the unit test for that would look like. So we use the same data provider and we just call that is external function that we have in our code that, um, you know, it does whatever it does. We don't really care. But we, this test runs very fast because it's, it's not creating the node. It's not creating the block and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, it's just checking if it's true or if it's false um, when you pass in those URLs. And then the the other side of it, so testing that the HTML class actually gets applied. So basically we just create one article, we put the two links, one that we already know is internal, one we already know is external into the body, and then we just do two assertions. So um, this example is, is um, really minimal, like there's not a whole lot of difference, but um, you know, in some cases you might want to be testing it. hundreds of data points or whatever. Um, so yeah, just something to keep in mind. Um, so then another thing you can do is reuse the setup task. So basically, traditionally, or in, in some test frameworks, um, there's kind of a convention to have one assertion per test case. So um, it, that might look like test that the external link class is added to the external links, and then we create our node, we do one assertion, and then the test is done. And then we have another test uh, to test that, it's, that it is not added to internal links, and we do the exact same thing again. Um, and there's a whole lot of setup involved, so we, we have to create a node each time. We have to set up and tear down the test. So instead, we can um, just combine it into one. Um, this is a fun one that I, I don't think a lot of people know about. So um, reducing HTTP requests is going to speed things up a lot. And so basically you don't actually have, sometimes you don't actually have to visit the node that you've created to, to test um, the output. So basically you can render the entity um, in code and then you can use this Symfony crawler um, to basically query, uh, okay, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong slide. So that basically that's a, that method is um, you, you pass in an entity to it and it basically spits out a symphony crawler, which is basically um, a, an, a class for um, checking if HTML elements exist inside rendered output. And then if we, um, 
if we want to use it. So basically, we create a node, uh, we create, we get a crawler for that node, and then we're filtering it by a um, CSS selector, and then we make an assertion like, um, does our link, you know, have that class or does it not have that class? So yeah, basically we've saved um, doing a HTTP request for that, um, but we still have the the HTML that would be output or that would be generated. Um, JavaScript tests, so you can kind of um, get stuck thinking, okay, if I need to test like media library or layout builder or WYSIWYG editors, all of that sort of stuff, you know, I have to do a JavaScript test so that I can populate those fields because you used to, you know, the off canvas or the dialog or anything like that. Um, but most of these things actually have non JavaScript fallbacks. So um, basically, the, the JavaScript functionality itself is already tested in core. You don't need to be testing that. So um, if possible, just you know, do a, a non-JavaScript test for these things. And then if you're writing your own JavaScript components and you want to test their functionality, we find that um, using Jest for that is usually more suitable and more reliable as well. Um, Selenium, which is the driver for running JavaScript tests, is, is slow and it, it's often flaky. I mentioned all of these things. Um, and then in your CI, you might be able to configure concurrency or parallelism, which allows you to run multiple tests at once. Um, we've got a package called PHP Unit Finder, which basically uh, creates a list of all your PHP unit tests in your project and you can pass the output of that to Circle CI, which has a split function, I think it's called. Um, and then it basically calculates the uh, average time it takes to run each of your tests and tries to like balance it out. So you, if you have like, you know, four runners going in parallel, it'll try to uh, make it so they all finish at about the same time. Um, so yeah, so basically um, the next part is about fostering a test-focused culture within your development team. Um, so yeah, basically having good test coverage gives you productivity without fear of breaking something. So you can come along with a, um, a new feature or changing the way a feature works or uh, implementing or installing updates or new modules or whatever. And you know that if your test suite passes, probably nothing's broken. Or if something does break, you know straight away, oh, okay, I wouldn't have even thought that, you know, that section of the site would be touched by um, this new feature, but it is. So you can go and, and fix that up. Uh, that helps with resourcing and onboarding of new developers. So if you have people moving around from team to team and on different projects and they, they're not really familiar with the site so much. Um, they, they might have more fear that they're going to break something. But if, you know, it, if you're used to having good test coverage, you know you're not going to um, create problems. Um, the tests can sort of uh, serve as a self-documenting um, API examples because if you, you've created this API, you've got test coverage for it, the test coverage is, you know, accessing the API in ways that you would expect it to be accessed to, accessed in, so you can, yeah, kind of refer to the test. Um, so to do this, yeah, basically add tests as you go. Don't, you know, leave it to the last minute before go live. You know, we'll, we'll write all the tests at the end once everything's ready to go, because it's just not going to happen. There's never any time then, um, and you're not going to remember all the things that you need to test. So basically, you know, every PR, should have test coverage. Um, don't, you know, approve your colleague's PI if it doesn't have test coverage or, you know, ask, hey, is this covered somewhere? Is there already existing coverage for this? Do we need more coverage? Um, that sort of thing. And yeah, um, allow time when you're estimating your tasks um, with your clients and your project managers to say, you know, this is going to take two days, but really, you know, maybe it's going to take three days when you're writing tests. Um, and it, you know, it might seem like more, but it's going to save you in the long run. So 
basically if that's just expected and always included then you know there's no no problems with it so uh, a quick recap um, use Drupal test traits if you want to um, read the docs read the example tests read other people's tests and just get familiar with what you can do um, write traits to make your life easier so you're not repeating yourself every time and you don't have to think about how do I put this block on this page you just call the, the method that you've already created um, share your traits with your development team maybe if it makes sense for you maybe create a separate repo that you can use across different projects and you know have it as a composer library um, yeah, be mindful of performance and find opportunities to make your builds faster. Avoid JavaScript tests where you can. Obviously, you know, do it when you need to. And yeah, write the damn test. Any questions? Um, I think, yeah, a lot of people have, sorry, the question was, um, have, are there existing libraries or repos or packages of help, helpful traits uh, that you can already use? Um, I think probably yes. I know at previous next we started one. Uh, it's open source, you can go and find it, but I think we've got one trait in there so far. Um, but I'm sure there are others that have done the same. Um, yeah, I think the problem is it often varies a lot from project to project on like your style of you know, how you do your fields or how you do put your blocks on your pages, all of that sort of stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, definitely um, have a look around. Yes, so, um, so Behat uh, has a whole bunch of components to it. I, I'm not actually horribly familiar with it, but we're mostly using Mink. Um, and yeah, the browser kit driver and the Selenium 2 driver from it. So Mink, I'm going to get this wrong, but I think Mink is kind of like um, an API for um, controlling a browser. Um, so when you do like Drupal get, that's talking to Mink and then Mink uses a driver. So if it's the browser kit driver, that's kind of like the PHP based mock browser thing. And then Selenium 2 is using like headless Chrome or Firefox or something like that. So we're not using, so Gherkin, the syntax that Behat uses, we're not using that. Um, and I'm sure there's other parts of Behat that, yeah, we're not using here. Yeah, so the question is um, if we're, when we're writing generic traits, if we're trying to contribute them upstream, um, I think, yeah, where it makes sense we do. I've certainly had a couple of merge requests against um, Drupal test traits. Um, so I, but I think it, I don't think it's trying to be a um, package that contains, you know, everything and trying to be prescriptive. It's just kind of a, a place to get started. Um, so yeah, I think there's certainly room in the ecosystem for, you know, something like that to exist. Um, yeah, mostly this, this is, doesn't look good, but most of the time we're like um, copying things from one project to another, and and you know that's a bit um, archaic. So yeah, um, yeah. Uh, th thanks a lot for those comments, and I'm really glad to hear that. Um, I will say there's definitely a, a place for um, those kernel tests and unit tests and the functional and functional JavaScript tests that we have in core and contrib where uh, you're shipping something that you don't know how it's going to be used, but when you're building your own site, then it makes sense to be testing your own site. Um, and I think, like, so Drupal Test Trace is not the only thing you can use. So Behat, which was mentioned, and I think there's a talk later today on Cypress, which I'm keen to check out because I haven't, haven't really had experience with that. So definitely going to have a look at that one. Great. Thank you very much, Michael. You can applause. Thank you.